All right. Uh, my name is Auke. I'm a researcher at Qualcomm. Uh, for those of you who don't know Qualcomm, uh, if you have an Android phone, it's very likely that you have a Snapdragon chip in it, which is by Qualcomm. Um, we're right here in Science Park. In fact, we'll move to Matrix 1 soon enough. And the talk I'll be giving is on uh, transformer efficiency, and it's about various types of efficiency, and hopefully the path towards deployment on edge devices. Because what I would personally like to see is that we can, in fact, deploy these models to any device, even low power, super constrained uh, edge device. Um, if you're interested in the research that Qualcomm is doing, I mean, obviously we're working on various topics. Uh, check out this Qualcomm AI research page. Uh, I, I'm not going to add marketing slides here, but just to give you an idea that we're working on various topics. The talk I'll give today is mostly about uh, two vision applications. I know many of you work on language, but hopefully you're still sort of interested in vision, as well as some of the research we're doing on quantizing language transformers. And uh, the end goal of all of the work that I'll present today is move towards efficient inference. Make sure that anyone can use these models on any device you can think of. And the reason I think that's important is that uh, I don't want to transmit all my data to uh, a cloud service every time I want a prediction. And obviously, there's also the big energy question, uh, just reducing energy use. Now, when I say compute efficiency, it's a bit of a loaded term. I'll talk about three uh, types of efficiency, or, or I'll distinguish three of them. Model size is the obvious one. I think today we already saw a talk where someone, uh, where you reduce model size from 180 billion to 11 billion parameters, so that's already 20x. That's excellent, that's what I'd like to see. Um, runtime, another obvious one, just time to make a forward pass. Reducing that is, of course, uh, extremely relevant. And the third one is a bit more difficult to measure, uh, energy use. Usually when we measure it, we just run a model on a mobile phone and then we measure how long it takes for the mobile phone to run out of power. But that of course depends on the device, it depends on all kinds of circumstances. So for this talk, I'll mostly focus on the first two. But keep in mind that the third one is probably the most impactful one. And these are correlated of course, if you have a very small model, then your runtime is low, your energy use is low. But it doesn't necessarily mean that you're optimizing all three of them. Sometimes you reduce a floating point operation and it turns out your model is actually more expensive. So. We're going to optimize the first two, and we're going to hope that the, the third one is uh, met as well. I'm going to talk about a few works. Uh, when Jakob asked me to give this talk, uh, I think I asked you, uh, do you want an overview talk, or do you want a specific talk? And he said, we have great academic speakers and uh, industry speakers, so let's do an overview. And I enthusiastically said yes, and then I learned that I had 20 minutes. But I'm going to do my best to cover quite a bit of this still. I am going to assume a lot of background knowledge uh, on Transformers, and hopefully you all have that. First work I'll cover is from my own team. Uh, I work in the neural data compression team, so we're in the business of building codecs using generative models. And the key insight from this work is that you can exploit sort of generic advances in transformers, in this case, SWIN transformers, to build more efficient models. Second work is video super resolution work by my colleague Davide, uh, which is about um, designing application-aware self-attention mechanisms. Not necessarily transformers, it's more about attention but I think quite related nevertheless. And the third one, as I said, is about quantization. And I think the story between these three, starting off from very generic improvements to more application-aware improvements in attention to making sure that we can run attention across many devices in fixed point efficiently, and that's the story with, uh, between these uh, three papers. And I think all three of these are necessary if we are going to deploy transformers to edge devices. So let's start with application one. For those of you who don't know, codecs compress data. You've probably heard of JPEG, MPEG, and so on. Maybe HEVC if you know video compression. And neural codecs do the same thing, but they learn how to do so by uh, learning from examples. Now most modern neural codecs, they follow this kind of autoencoder structure. So there's an input image, or in this case an image, it could be a video. And an encoder produces some quantized latent variable Z. This quantized latent variables transmitted to the other end, and the decoder uh, reconstructs the input. And uh, of course, it needs to be as close as possible. Now, oftentimes, there's also a prior or context model, uh, which learns to model this distribution of, of quantized latent variables in an unconditional way. And for those of you familiar with information theory, if you have this model in hand, you can do entropy coding, compress it even more efficiently. But I'll not go into detail on that. And the way these are trained is fairly straightforward. We simply have two losses. 
one rate loss that tells you how many bits do I pay to transmit this variable Z to the other end, and a reconstruction loss, which is kind of fidelity, uh, so how close are these two. So that's all there is to it. Congrats, you're now all experts on neural image and video compression. Um, the question is, of course, how can we make this more efficient? And I'll first show you end results, and then I'll show you how we got there. So what you see here is a picture with on the x-axis the decoding time, one of these compute efficiency measures that I talked about, and on the y-axis compression performance where higher is better. It's, it's rate savings in this case, but the axis is flipped. Just trust me when I say higher is better. Most of the convolutional models, they are shown here in red. The SWIN transformer-based models that we introduced are shown in black, and some of the, excuse me, some of the related work Ah, you're doing this manually. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Some of the related work uh, is shown here in um, orange, these, uh, these stars that you see here. So of course, convolutional models, they work very well. This is the sort of vanilla codec architecture, but they have mediocre compression performance to, uh, relative to the state of the art. Now the state of the art, very good compression performance, but hopefully you can see on this x-axis there's a big skip and all of a sudden a logarithmic scale. So if you want to wait 10 seconds to decode one image, I probably would not use that codec. What's interesting though is that most do use transformer-based components here. Uh, they, they create very powerful autoregressive prior models based on transformers, but that's exactly why you get this high runtime. And of course, where we come in, we take uh, SWIN transformer-based uh, designs, uh, we design SWIN transformer-based codecs, and shifted window attention, if you're familiar with it, is a bit more cheap memory-wise than uh, global self-attention. And I'll talk a bit more about that later. And by adopting this, we get much better runtime. In fact, surprisingly good runtime. And when compared to these convolutional models, much better performance per parameter. So for each of these models, I show the uh, parameter count. Those are the numbers here. So for example, you can see that this 9.1 million transformer-based model is comparable in performance to the 21 million convolutional model. So probably, to many of you, a very familiar story. Add attention, everything becomes better. Um, this charm variation, I, I won't go into detail on it, it's just another variation on this model um, that is also autoregressive. Now, what do we change about this codec? We adopt these SWIN transformer blocks. For those of you familiar with vision transformers, uh, vision transformers, as you probably know, um, compute attention globally. And they do this at multiple uh, subsequent layers. But at every layer, they compute self-attention globally. So they divide the image into patches, and on those tokens, the attention is computed. And SWIN transformers, they borrow quite a few inductive biases from convolutional architectures. So instead, at the highest resolution, they compute self-attention locally in small windows. And then as you progress through this network at every uh, consecutive layer, uh, the self-attention is computed on well the, the same size window, but this is now um, a hopefully semantically more meaningful concept. So again, lower layers, edges, higher layers, semantics, and then final layers, classes. The way we adopt this is fairly straightforward. This encoder, for example, in a vanilla codec, simply a couple of strided comps with 5x5 five five kernels. And we replace these by custom downsampling blocks as well as swing transformer blocks. Simple as that. Of course, on the decoder side, you do the inverse, so you have custom upsampling blocks and swing transformer blocks. But a fairly straightforward modification, all in all. And what's great about this, like in the performance plot I showed previously, you gain quite a bit in time to decode. And also, the number of multiply and accumulate operations, uh, essentially flops, is lower for swing models than for conf. But there is a catch. We do use a lot more memory, about 3x compared to convolutional models. So you, here you see we're optimizing two metrics, but at the same time, one is actually becoming a lot worse. And depending on which device you deploy to, memory may actually be the much more important one. There's also a bigger caveat. All these results are on desktop GPUs and not on, let's say, a mobile phone. And of course, when you want to deploy these, it becomes much more important to actually uh, measure this on device. Nevertheless, a step in the right direction. But let's take another step in that direction, and let's see if we can use uh, awareness of the applications and domain knowledge, essentially, to design more efficient attention mechanisms. And for that, uh, first, you're going to have to become experts on video separate resolution, and luckily that's a bit easier than compression. So video separate resolution, as the name implies, you have a low resolution input, pass it through an upsampler, 
out comes a high resolution output, fairly simple. You can train this end to end with, uh, with the distortion objective. The difficulty here is that this is an ill post problem. So a low resolution input, uh, no sorry, other way around, a high resolution output, um, no, low <laughs> resolution input corresponds to many high resolution outputs potentially. So if you just do this in isolation, then of course you're going to see temporal in inconsistencies if you do this for every frame completely in isolation. And so typically what is done to address this is take multiple frames into account. And um, one inductive bias that's used here often is to temporally align these low resolution frames when you upsample some frame of interest. And what this looks like is, for example, uh, something like this. So we have this support frame. This could be an earlier frame in our video sequence. And we're going to use this as context. And now we want to upsample this frame to enhance. Now you can all see there's a lot of similarity between these. Makes sense. It's probably pretty difficult from where you're sitting to see how these align. So let me help you a bit. This is the displacement field, the, the optical flow, if you will. So you see there's a lot of movement. This guy with the pink jacket and the lady in purple behind him. So if we want to make use of this left frame, we're upsampling the right one, we need to somehow align these frames. And we need to make sure that we well, estimate this displacement field, for example, and align them before doing super resolution. Displacement, however, uh, we could do this using global self-attention, but displacement is often quite local. And the temporal inconsistencies we care about are actually a pretty small um, resolution. We also know that when the background is static, we probably don't have to do any alignment. And for many videos, this is the case. The background is completely static. There are objects moving through the scene. So we can exploit that. And this is where the gated local self-attention comes in. So to get to this, uh, this innovation with Davide, let me go from global self-attention all the way to gated. Global self-attention, the attention matrix is shown here, um, computes attention globally, as the name implies. We can subsample in either of these dimensions in order to make it a bit more cheap to compute. Um, we can also use local self-attention, which means that for any uh, query, we're only going to look at, uh, sorry, for any key, we're only going to look at a couple of queries. And gated local self-attention takes this one step further by saying, for those areas where we're already perfectly aligned, we don't even have to do local self-attention. We can just use exactly the identity, just look at the current patch, you don't have to do anything here. So what this looks like in image space is uh, on the left, we have this, uh, this global subsampled self-attention. And you can see this query as a red dot. It will look all over the image and, and figure out what matches, how can I align. Of course, this is way too much information for the task at hand. We can do local self-attention, which is already a lot better. Uh, so we're only going to consider a local area when performing alignment. And now gated uh, local self-attention also figures out if, if uh, no alignment is necessary, we're going to just disable those weights as well. Here I colored them in dark gray instead of light gray, but essentially they are uh, colored in light gray as well. And putting this all together, we still have to figure out how to uh, find that mask, of course. Um, in this work, we do this by learning how to gate. So we take this support frame and this reference frame that we want to upsample, compute the residual between those two, so you get sort of for free where are they already aligned, and feed that to some gating function, which of course is learned. And th this gives you exactly this mask. So in which cases do we need to perform alignment and where do we not? Then putting that all together, pushing it through uh, this attention mechanism, we get the aligned support frame, which we can then use to perform a super resolution for our original frame. So. We're asserting quite a bit of domain knowledge here, right? We're explicitly talking only about alignment. We, we are learning this end to end in the end, but um, there are a lot of inductive biases here. But it turns out that for this application, that allows us to save a lot of compute. So again, here on the x axis is the compute axis, in this case, multiply and accumulate operations. Y axis is quality. So again, higher and to the left is better. And uh, we see that this gated local self-attention mechanism gets nearly a 1 dB improvement over this uh, gray star in the bottom left. Whereas comparable PSNR models, at that time the state of the art, by now probably uh, outdated, um, they're more than five times as expensive when measured in max. So although it goes a bit against the grain of letting transformers figure things out for themselves, we can exploit domain knowledge quite a bit in order to design much more efficient attention mechanisms. 
And I would argue that if we want to deploy these to Edge, then we will have to. Lastly, excellent. I want to talk a bit about um, quantizing language models. So far, so far this has been about vision. Um, but my colleague Yelise recently published a paper on quantization, which I think is even closer to deployment to Edge. Um, what he did is first analyze for a language model, in this case a BERT model, and as well as some variations, uh, on the GLUE benchmark. What is the effect of quantizing these models? What's the effect on task performance? Now, many of you will know the GLUE benchmark better than I do, so I don't have to explain that hopefully, but it's just performance across a couple of tasks that hopefully are correlated with language understanding. And what we do is investigate different model configurations or quantization configurations. There's, of course, the original floating point 32 model, high precision weights. And then there are these quantized variations. So W8 means quantize the bits, uh, quantize the weights to 8 bit. And A8 means uh, quantize the activations to 8 bit. Now, of course, the W8 A8 model will then be the cheapest. Or uh, I say, of course, but. Um, fixed point inference is generally much more efficient on hardware than floating point inference. So this will by far be the cheapest of those configurations. And in fact, will also have a big effect on power use. Now the question Yelise asked was, can we quantize BERT using a standard post-training quantization technique? And what this means is quantization without any fine tuning. So you incur some loss when you quantize this model. And it, uh, sometimes you can do uh, fine tuning to recover some of that. This is post-training quantization. We don't do any fine-tuning. And as it happens, um, floating point 32 performance is, of course, in the top row. Quantizing the weights actually is fine. You, you lose a little bit of performance here and there, but it's quite okay. It's the activations where scores are really harmed. So that means we need to look deeper into those uh, to figure out where the issue is if we want to quantize these models. And what we can do is a leave one out study. So what this means is you quantize every layer except for one, and then you figure out um, if performance is retained, then that layer is to blame for your performance drop. So we did this for a couple of variations, and it turns out that this uh, connection you see here in red, so the residual connection right after this feedforward net, is to blame for the performance drop. To solve that, uh, you have to know a bit of background on quantization as well. Um, Quantization is typically done by moving floating point values to some grid, to some fixed point, so you lose a lot of precision. And of course, you could choose different grids. You could choose to quantize uniformly. You could choose a logarithmic grid, as displayed here. But you can also change the granularity with which you quantize. So instead of using one grid per entire tensor, you could say, I do it per token, I do it per embedding. And trying all these variations and seeing what the effect on performance is, we found that uh, logarithmic grid helps a bit, but it's not sufficient. Per token, slightly better. But you really gain a lot when you do per embedding quantization. So one quantization grid per uh, embedding vector. Even when you only apply this to key troublesome activations, uh, one, two, and three here. So that's, of course, a great sign. And the paper goes much deeper than that. But I just wanted to give a high-level overview. We know that post-training quantization of these models is uh, difficult mainly because of this activation quantization now. But we know that with this per embedding quantization, we can partially address it. Uh, the paper also looks into other variations of these models and verifies that it is the case, not just for BERT, but also for the still BERT and all kinds of variations. It, it proposes a couple of other solution methods as well, including even more compute efficient ones than per embedding quantization. And it looks into much lower bit widths, like four bits, two bits. And it, it turns out that um, for many of the models that we currently use, if we want to deploy these to edge devices, move to fixed point, we will have to address this problem in some way. And, and luckily, there's more and more research coming out on exactly this topic. And again, the reason that I think it's important is that uh, quantization can reduce things like memory use. Of course, floating 32 versus 8-bit uh, fixed point, it already saves you a bit of storage. But especially runtime and power use are the big ones. And th this is especially the case if you're running on you know, low power devices. So. Wrapping up, hopefully I gave you a bit of an overview of the ways we're working on transformers. Uh, we care a lot about efficiency, although I'm also excited about scale, obviously. Um, we do this in a couple of ways. We just adopt generic efficient transformer and attention mechanisms. Uh, we design efficient attention mechanisms for specific applications. 
and we are interested in quantizing these models and hopefully optimizing them for many different devices. And I believe that deployment to devices will require all three. Uh, so if there's any call to action here, I hope that you're also excited about low computer transformer models and not just about scaling them up. If you have questions, let me know. Yep. Hi, thanks for the talk. Do you actually run all of those models on Snapdragon CPUs or Adreno GPUs? We, of course, want to run them on Snapdragon. Um, it depends a bit on the model. I didn't include them on purpose in here uh, because most of the benchmarks that we do are internal. They're not, they're not public necessarily, like power usage and so on. It's not something that we, uh, we give away in, in these kinds of presentations. But obviously, we want to, them to work well on uh, both CPU, GPU, and any neural processor that we have. So typically benchmark on all of them. What we do in practice, you know, at test time when you use your mobile phone, that I don't know. That's uh, a bit deeper than uh, where my expertise ends. All right, thank you. Other questions? All right, thank you. Um, I was interested in the, uh, the gated local attention. It seems to be uh, like some kind of sparse uh, attention. Is this also optimized in, in a matrix multiplication? Because typically you need to have some kind of uh, predictable patterns in the dimensions. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, so. Hmm? These ones. Of course, you need both the hardware and the software to support this. Uh, just using the attention matrix on the right as is will likely not be so cheap because uh, software hasn't been optimized for exactly this operation. So it's a good point. This work is mainly um, trying to figure out if that gain can be made and not necessarily at the, the practical part of, of engineering this particular kernel for on-device use. But yeah, you're completely right. Without the software or hardware to back it up, uh, you don't get the gains for free. Other questions? Maybe you can close it up. Thank you for the talk, Aqua. I learned so much again. Um, to what degree are these things influenced by uh, properties of the data? So, for instance, take super resolution. If I have to do that on human faces and I train a model, I learn super resolution. There's all kinds of optimization choices, design choices. Now I apply it on other data with different distributions. Do I have to redo everything? To what degree is this robust? Can you say a few things about the robustness of certain of these choices uh, compared to, you know, relative to applying them to different data distributions? Are you specifically talking about gated local self-attention or...? Well, or? You, you, I think the full story, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm myself most familiar with super resolution. Uh, and I, I know that I run into that problem there, but I, I figure it, it occurs in all these applications. Sure. Yeah, for number one and number three, it's easy. We use generic attention mechanisms, train this codec on new data, it will almost automatically work. I honestly expect to see similar gains across many different data sets. Uh, quantization, same holds. It may be less of a problem for some modalities or for some language than for others, but I think similar quantization problems will occur across many different models, as, as Yelise showed. For this one, it's a bit more difficult, right? We designed this for a specific application with efficiency in mind. So perhaps if you go to, uh, I don't know, some different video, sports video, where movement is always huge, uh, maybe temporal consistencies will be a lot stronger, and this local self-attention or even this gating mechanism may not work so well. So I think for one and three, the story is pretty clear. For this one, may require some human intervention. So maybe to close it off, I'm just curious, could you give us uh, like a ballpark of how big a model can you run nowadays on one of the latest you know, mobile chips uh, after you do all of the tricks that you have in the, in the toolbox? It's a very similar question to the, the first one, I think. Um, I'm going to say I don't know, and even if I did, I probably couldn't tell you. <laughs> but honestly, I don't know.